you hear me? Okay, so first I want to thank for the invitation and I'm happy to be here after last year where I could just give a virtual talk. So I will talk about our insights on the superconducting phase diagram of strontium ruthenate from thermodynamic measurements under uniaxial pressure. And ah, okay. Good, I will first give a brief introduction and then show you two experiments taken on the same sample, basically a heat capacity measurement and the measurement of the luster caloric effect, and at the end I will summarize. So when we look at different classes of unconventional superconductors, for example, heavy fermion, high TC cuprates, ion mictides, or even the organic superconductors, we always find a magnetic phase in proximity to the unconventional superconducting phase, independent of the underlying physics in these materials. So one uh, outlying example here was strontium ruthenate, where there was no indication of a, super, of a magnetic phase nearby so far. But I will show you that this changed. Oops. Okay, so what are we doing? We are using hydrostatic or uniaxial pressure to tune quantum materials because in that way we can do a clean tuning without introducing additional disorder by substitution or doping or we are also not polarizing the material by using the, the magnetic field as tuning parameter and in particular Uniaxial pressure can also break lattice symmetries. For example, when we have a tetragonal system, like in the case of strontium ruthenate, when we apply uniaxial strain along one of the uh, one of the axes in the plane, we break the symmetry and go from a tetragonal to a orthorhombic material. So strontium ruthenate was the first non-cuprate layer perovskite superconductor. In very clean samples, one finds a TC of 1.5 Kelvin, and you need only a very small amount of disorder to destroy superconductivity in this material. It's an unconventional superconductor. It's important to know that in the, uh, no the normal state, under ambient conditions, is a Fermi liquid. And, oops, uh, sorry for that. And basically, until 2019, the most discussed pairing symmetry was P-wave. And that is actually when we started our experiment. So that's what we initially wanted to look at when you expect a P-wave symmetry and you break the tetragonal lattice symmetry and go to the, through to the orthorhombic. You would expect that you have here this splitting and you would obviously then see um, two transitions in heat capacity. In resistivity, of course, when the sample has zero resistance, you just see nothing anymore, and that's why we uh, started the whole investigation. However, it turned out by a study of Stuart Brown's group that the P-wave symmetry is excluded. So originally, this P-wave was based on uh, night shift in NMR measurements that were experiments from Ishida in 98, where he found that uh, the spin susceptibility did not reduce in the superconducting state, what you expect for uh, odd pairing. And here I show you data which Ishida repeated 25 years later on the very same crystal, and it turned out that basically the there was a heating effect, so basically the NMR, the signal put it on the, putting on the sample was too large, and that is why the spin stability stayed constant. So what basically the new results with a smaller excitation energy showed that indeed there is a drop of the, in the night shift. And that basically uh, excludes P-wave pairing, however, the Muir's R results and care effect, which were also repeated, still showed that uh, time reversal symmetry is, is broken in strontium ruthenate. So that uh, stays. Okay, so what 
was known from susceptibility and resistivity measurements when once applying uniaxial strain along the 1 0 0 direction in the plane, one observes a large enhancement of the susceptibility which peaks around a compressive strain of 0 point minus 0 point 0.4. And that could be explained by tuning the material through a Van Hover singularity. So basically, we just have to look at the gamma band here. And when we apply strain along the 1 0 0 direction, basically this band is elongated and basically going through this Van Hove singularity and then we have here this band is opening. And that was actually confirmed by ARPES experiments where you see here this, this closed band and then at higher strains it's opening. And basically we have a strong response under uniaxial strain. One can tune the material to the Van Hove singularity. But of course the question is what is uh, thermodynamic properties in this material. So this could be also just the surface effect, for, for instance. And one is also expecting at this Van Hove singularity, of course, a strongly enhanced density of states. And that should be also a signature in the heat capacity. So that was basically the setting when we started our experiment. And let me just show you what we did here. We had this uniaxial strain device, which was developed by Clifford Hicks. And we have here three piezo stacks. And in this design, basically these, when you apply a positive voltage to them, these are expanding. And this one here is compressing. And in that sense, when you cool down the device, you compensate for the thermal contraction so you don't break the sample just by cooling down. And what is also nice in this device, the sample is much shorter than the piezo stack, so you have a gearing effect and can apply a much larger strain than when you would just glue the sample on the piezo stack, what was done before. And So as I said, our, desire, our approach is we wanted to measure heat capacity and obviously the sample is glued well to the rig so you can't do just the adiabatic measurement or a relaxation measurement. So we had to set up an AC heat capacity measurement and with that one, one can adjust the frequency and find uh, the right frequency that we can carry out the experiment by adjusting basically the coupling from thermometer to heater and to the bath. And here we have three, uh, when we change the frequency and here plot the response of the AC amplitude in the low frequency range, most of the heat is lost to the bath. At high frequency, only part of the sample thermalizes which in our experiment will become crucial. And in principle, the best window is here in the middle where the heat capacity is proportional to one over the oscillation amplitude. And that is how this design look like. So we have here a, a thermocouple glued to the sample and that is a small heater. And basically the heat is flowing through the sample. Here it plays also a role the orientation of the sample, but that's too detailed. And when we now just do frequency sweep, we indeed see that we come in this region where we have the plateau, which we want to have. But it's not the best to stay in the middle of the plateau, so we want to go to the high frequency edge. And that is because when we strain the sample, obviously, more or less homogeneous strain we just have in the middle of the sample and here the strain is building up. This you see, for example, at this uh, low frequency where we still see a signature from the unstrained sample and here we have the strained part. We go to higher frequency and at 1.5 kilohertz we just see a single transition. When we go further up, we have a much worse uh, signal to noise ratio. So one has to play around a bit with the frequency one is operating that. And due to this coupling, unfortunately, one gets only uh, relative values of the heat capacity. And that is what we observe. We can really 
follows the transition. So we have a thermal, thermodynamic evidence that TC is maximum under uniaxial strain, it's bulk superconductivity. And even so, that's only um, a relative data. We can say something about the jump in the heat capacity because that's basically at the same temperature. And we see that the jump size is increasing with increasing strain and it's getting the maximum value as Van Hove singularity. And that's also basically excluding to some extent that there is a node at the direction, at the 100 direction. So, but that was data which is already a little bit older. Let me now come to a much more tricky experiment. Basically, with the same setup, we can measure the elastocaloric effect. So, we just neglect the heater here. We still use the thermocouple. And in addition to this DC voltage to apply the strain, we put the uh, AC voltage oscillating amplitude on this inner stack. And in that sense, we have, uh, uh, we have here this oscillating strain. And then we measure the temperature. And what the elastocaloric effect is basically analog to the magnetocaloric effect here. And so we apply delta epsilon, the oscillation of the strain, and we measure the oscillation of the temperature. And in that way, we have direct access to the strain derivative of the entropy. And that is a quite important property. And as I said, that was really done on exactly the same sample. So we can do simultaneous heat capacity and elastocaloric effect measurement. And to look at this, one can consider basically this uh, elastocaloric effect as a virtual heater. So when you just write down the differential for the entropy, you can consider the C dt dt, the time derivative of the temperature as a heating power. And that explains basically that we have the same like we had before in case of the AC heat capacity measurements. I don't want to go too much in details here to save time. And we can do the same. We have again these two regions, uh, these three regions, and we can adjust the frequency for the right measurement window. And then you see here uh, one frequency sweep, and we then sit at 1.5 or 4.5 uh, kilohertz to do our measurements. And as I said before, the heater is still attached, but we are not using it. And now I show you strain sweeps. So basically here at eight Kelvin, we see that we have a zero crossing of the temperature oscillation at the Van Hove singularity. So basically that indicates that we have a maximum in the entropy so we have the, because here we have a negative slope, and when we then go to lower temperatures, we see that here an additional feature is appearing. This I will discuss later on. So that is related to a magnetic phase, but we see that here the zero crossing is almost not changing, and then the last temperature above superconductivity, and when we then, I just clean the picture a bit, go below, we see that here we have a reversal of the ECE signal. So we have still the zero crossing, but the second the derivative is changing. So we have, instead of a maximum in entropy, we have now minimum in entropy. So we have a quench of the entropy. And so th let me just summarize here the experimental effects, so we have the entropic signal by entering in the superconducting state is well pronounced. We have a maximum entropy at the Van Hove singularity at in the normal state, which is quenched to uh, and turning into a minimum below TC. And away from the Van Hove point, uh, we have basically a, a reversal of the um, all, basically, the signal almost reverses uh, size. 
what's now important to compare this with literature, we can look at the Greenizer parameter, which is basically just delta T divided by delta epsilon times one over T. And from that we learn, as expected for Fermi liquid, at low strains, the curves fall all on top of each other. And at the Van Hove singularity of minus 0.4% strain, it diverges. And at higher strain, the screenizer scaling is poorly obeyed. When we now compare that with uh, calcul or calculations by uh, our collaborating theories, so from Markus Gast and Jörg Schmalia, they were setting up a tight binding model and basically they could also to the numbers here in the same range could reproduce the behavior at the Van Hove singularity. But of course I don't see this feature here at, at higher compressive strains. And they also find this reversal of the signal which is found in the experiment. And what is important here, they can only explain, explain the experimental findings assuming a full gap superconductor at the one zero zero direction. So that excludes uh, that the node cannot be in this direction. That is for example excluding dx square minus y square symmetry for uh, strontium ruthenate. And yeah, as I said, it suggests a full gap superconductor to make this a little bit more colorful. So we can do a color map. And here the white lines are where the elastocaloric effect is zero. And that is showing this uh, line at the Van Hove singularity that has indeed some curvature which is also reproduced by the theory, but it's not yet clear why it's not uh, a vertical line. We also see this uh, entering into the superconducting state. And we have here another line, which I will uh, discuss in the following. From MUSR experiments, we have here one single uh, point. And MUSR have shown that this phase is most likely anti-ferromagnetically ordered, so it's clear that it's a magnetically ordered phase. And we found that this is suppressed to zero temperature close to the strain where superconductivity disappears. I just want to show you also some temperature sweep data. And here you see one example, I just want to which I want to point out, when you look at zero strain, you almost see here no signal at all. And that is basically kind of obvious because here TC doesn't show any strain dependence. So measuring of the elastocaloric effect makes only sense when the, you really have a strain dependence in your feature. So initially, basically, you have here no different contrast between both the superconducting and the normal phase. You can do more with this data using an iterative method. You can calculate uh, the entropy just using the initial entropy, which is known from heat capacity, and then you run this three, four, five times, and then you end up with an entropy curve like that one here, and you see that there is a drop in entropy at this uh, phase transition to the antiferromagnetic phase. And that we indeed find here at different temperatures at 7.5 Kelvin, we don't see that. But then we see this drop appearing and it's shifting to lower strains. And we can even quantify that. First of all, it looks more like a first order transition, even so it's quite broadened from the decrease we can estimate a drop of three millijoule per mole Kelvin squared, which is 8% of the electronic entropy of the unstrained material. And it's a similar value what is found at the three to seven strontium ruthenate, which is magnetic. And so it's quite comparable to, to that one. And 
this reduction of the entropy in the magnetic phase is also in line with the conventional expectations of uh, gapping of the Fermi surface. Then we also looked back to the heat capacity data and also made this colorful plot. And sometimes these plots are really helping. And there's also features seen at this transition line to the magnetic state. So and basically, we indeed found some similarities of strontium rusinate, which was previously not appreciated to the cuprate, nictite, organic, or heavy fermion superconductivity, uh, superconductors where also uh, antiferromagnetic phase is close by, whatever this means. So this work was, of course, only realized with many collaborators where I want to especially point out Yu Sheng Yi, which did all this experimental work and did a lot in optimizing it to really get out this data, which was really highly challenging. So the first part of the heat capacity was done as part of his uh, PhD thesis. And then when he came back as a postdoc, he worked further on the elastocaloric effect. And last but not least, I put up the summary here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Very nice talk. OK, immediate question. Very nice talk. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, first, the magnetism comes from ruthenium, I suppose. Is it correct? Because you say you d before it was not appreciated, the magnetic phase. But it was not found, so it was not really seen. Yeah, so there is just so and last thing is, does it come from ruthenium uh, atoms or who, who brings the magnetic probably. moments? Probably, but we know that the magnetic phase from the muons are so mm -hmm. it's just a single point in a strain mm -hmm. experiment, and that it's really mm -hmm. to follow the phase line that we could only do with, with our experiment mm -hmm. here. So that is uh, what kind of magnetic phase it is. We don't know yet. Ah, okay. Ma the, now the main question: You have shown very nice curves across above and below uh, TC, let's say. What is your, let's say, best uh, bet? What is the normal state and the superconducting state in view of this new, because the P is excluded now. So do you have an idea or? So I, I was just, we had just some internal retreat mm -hmm. and I was just making some fun with uh, Andy McKenzie and tell you we are excluding more and more other parameters and at the end we will conclude that it's no superconductivity anymore. So. It has to be, but at the moment, different method excluding different order parameters, and I, I think it's really difficult at the moment to just jump on one. Okay, thank you. Another question, please, from here. Hi, so I understood quite well that you have an antiferromagnetic phase, you have a superconducting dome. What was not clear to me in this similarity is do you have a pseudogap state? I can't, where should it, so probably not, but we, it's, it's not a high TC, so I would not expect to see. Well, so uh, above the, Above the dome, you can have a pseudo-gap state even if it's low TC. Yeah, but I, there's no indication for any pseudo-gap okay. state. Right. Okay, yeah, thank you. Because, okay, the question, they can just support the question because some of these usual superconductors, they show something looking like pseudo-gap, the same titanium nitrate, for example. Then, well, it was not investigated in terms of pseudo-gap but it was something like that measured experimentally. So that's where the question is coming from. But anyway. I, I mean, none of, I mean, this material was quite well investigated and there was no indication for, for any pseudo gap. Okay. Ah, so there were some measurements above TC. Well, I showed some measurements above TC. Uh, so what I, I mean that in titanium nitrate, there were some measurements, STM measurements above TC, 
and they've seen something like, okay, pseudogap, which was not interpreted like a pseudogap at that time. I, I mean, you, have, you saw the device, this data is taken under uniaxial strain and so far no one was adapting that in a SDM. I see. So that is not, now I got to your point, so that is not, not done yet. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, more questions? Well, if not, let's thank the speaker again. And give them thank the certificate. You. And let's thank all the speakers of the session once more time. Sorry?